to start the recording? Yes, good job. Um, as a preliminary matter, good evening. Uh, we do have Spanish interpretation available this evening. And so I'm going to turn it over to Rosario Aragon to explain uh, in Spanish how uh, people can access that. And then we'll get started. Rosario? Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, hay traducción simultánea al español durante esta reunión. Para poder acceder a la interpretación al español, por favor, hagan clic en el icono del globo terráqueo que se encuentra en la parte de abajo a la derecha en su pantalla de Zoom, donde pueden seleccionar el canal de español para escuchar esta reunión en español. Muchas gracias. Alex, I'm not hearing her. Are you? Mary Catherine, she did announce the thing for everyone who was in the attendee list. So since you're in the English channel, channel maybe you didn't hear, but she did announce everything's good to go. Mary Catherine, everyone, all the attendees heard her do the announcement, so you're good to go. Mary Catherine, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear us. I don't think she can hear us. My apologies, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, can you hear yes. us? I can now, I couldn't hear you before. I'm not sure what happened with my, I think it was my AirPods. Uh, did Rosario give her a description of how to she engage? Did. Okay. She did. Awesome. Okay. Are we ready to get started? All right. Yep, go ahead. I apologize for that. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Catherine Gibbs. I'm uh, the land use attorney for HRP, the new uh, the owner of the Potomac River Generating Station site. I want to welcome you all to what is our seventh uh, community engagement event that HRP has organized to discuss the redevelopment of the Potomac River Generating Site in Old Town North. Before we begin, there are a few items we want to uh, review to ensure that everyone is comfortable using Zoom. Audience members, please note uh, you're muted on both audio and camera. Uh, we do this to ensure that we're able to efficiently review the materials and answer all your questions. If you're interested in asking questions or making comments, we ask that you submit those through the Q&A function you should be seeing at the bottom of your screen. You can click on the icon where you will then be prompted to type and submit your questions. We also do this so that all questions are logged on our end. The chat box function and the raise your hand function will not work. We'll be gathering questions received during the meeting and we'll answer as many as we can during the question and answer session of the meeting after our presentation. Any questions we're unable to cover in the time we have allotted for tonight's meeting will be saved so that we can provide written answers to all of them and post them on our website in a couple of weeks. We're also recording this meeting and we'll post a recording of this meeting on our website as well. For those of us who are joining us by phone, you can send questions and comments to HRP info mid Atlantic at hillcoglobal.com. All of this information will be in, um, uh, available in the chat function. We will do our best to check this email and ask and answer these questions during the meeting. If we're not able to answer them, we will uh, share the answer along with those questions asked on our website, as we said, www.hrpalx.com, where the answers to all these questions will be posted. We're here to listen to your comments and answer your questions to the greatest extent we can. We'll be covering a lot of information and we'll leave plenty of time for questions and we can always go back to a slide during the question and answers if you like. Again, thank you all for being here tonight and we will go ahead and get started. Next slide. Here's our agenda for tonight. Um, at all of our community engagement events as a part of this process, HRP wants to assure everyone that there will be plenty of opportunity for community engagement to participate, and here we are. We're committed to working together through this process. Tonight, we're going to discuss land use and height on the site. We'll start by a brief introduction of our plans, and then we'll discuss land use first and then building height with plenty of time for questions at the end. Next slide. As I said earlier, we had had multiple events to engage with the community even before we submitted our first CDD concept plan to the city at the end of July of last year. 
As we discussed at our last meeting on November 29th, we were submitting our second CDD concept plan in December, along with responses to the city's comments on that first submission. We received comments back from the city on that CDD2 submission, and we're working through those now. This is our seventh community meeting, and it will focus on land use and height. Other upcoming community meetings I'll get back to on the next slide. All of these submissions and topical meetings are moving us towards public hearings on the CDD concept plan in June of this year. Next slide. We thought it was important to demonstrate the level of outreach and community engagement that has occurred so far and what is still forthcoming. We started almost a year ago with our first meeting in February of 2021. This is a big project and it deserves significant discussion and input from many stakeholders, including you. So far, we have held over 20 meetings with the community, the city staff, and the National Park Service, and we'll be having more. What's important to note in the first two columns is the number of meetings with the stakeholders between the first and second submission. Significant input was solicited and helped move this process forward. The highlighted items reflect what is coming up in the next month. There'll be a work session with the Planning Commission this coming Tuesday, February 1st at 6 p.m. And the City Council will also have a work session on February 22nd. Then we'll have our next community meeting on environment and sustainability on February 24th. We will make our next submission to the city in February. Other upcoming meetings are in the process of being scheduled, including a community meeting in March on transportation. We haven't set that March date, but we'll keep you updated as soon as we do. We'll also have other meetings in the coming months with groups like NOTICE, the Old Town North Alliance, the Urban Design Advisory Committee, the Affordable Housing, um, the Alexandria Housing Affordability Advisory Committee, uh, and the Environmental Policy Commission, among others. We're working hard to continue to solicit your input and input from a range of stakeholders in Alexandria, but also more specifically, Old Town North. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Melissa Schrock. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa Schrock, and I lead the mixed use development team at HRP. Uh, we appreciate all the great opportunities that we've had over the past year to meet with the community, city staff, and city leadership as we develop the vision for the redevelopment of the PRGS site. Of course, the CDD stage that we are currently in is still very early in the overall process of redeveloping a site like PRGS with all of its complexity. But commercial real estate projects typically deliver a variety of mitigations to offset their impacts like storm water and traffic impacts, and also a variety of public benefits so that the community and the municipality can share in the value that is created through development. We thought it would be helpful to provide some early information on both the scope and the costs of those benefits and mitigations as we discuss <clears throat> the land use, bulk, and density aspects of the project tonight. This isn't intended to be a final list, and these certainly aren't the final costs, but we believe in having a transparent dialogue with the community, and so we thought it was important to share our early details and estimates with you. First and foremost, the PRGS site operated as a coal-fired power plant for over 70 years and was shuttered about 10 years ago, thanks to the advocacy of Alexandrians. It will require significant above and below grade remediation, as well as deconstruction of the existing facility in order to enable the land to be redeveloped for its future use. Our early projections indicate that costs of at least $60 million will uh, be incurred for that work, and we'll be refining that number as we begin to bid the abatement and deconstruction work, which we hope to begin before the end of this year. Of course, we won't be rebuilding a power plant, and the future buildings will be designed with sustainable strategies and systems. While we haven't begun actual building design yet, and we don't know the um, exactly what programs will be implemented and we don't know exactly the associated costs yet. We are working on an initial carbon neutrality analysis and we'll also be submitting a sustainability master plan with our infrastructure DSUP later this year. 
These documents will be a framework for future development decisions and will guide the project in relation to the city's sustainability goals laid out in the small area plan and in the environmental action plan. As Mary Catherine mentioned, our next community meeting on February 24th will go into more detail on both environmental remediation and sustainability topics. Um, there are a number of public realm benefits associated with the project in addition. Not only will it extend the Old Town North arts and cultural corridor into the site, providing on-site arts uses, but there will also be over five acres of public open space provided on site and improvements made to that land and to the existing and future abutting parkland with an estimated cost of between 30 and $35 million. Lastly, the project made the early commitment to build the vast majority of the parking below grade, which creates a much better pedestrian experience and allows for street level activation. It does come with a significant price tag, which we estimate to be approximately $150 million across the project. Next slide, please. In terms of affordable housing, our team is currently working with the Office of Housing to develop what's called an affordable housing plan. At a minimum, that plan will provide a voluntary contribution of approximately seven and a half to $11.4 million in today's dollars, depending on the final mix of uses, how much is residential versus how much is commercial. We're also evaluating the path to creation of on-site affordable units, which we'll touch on in more detail later in tonight's presentation. On the transportation front, the project will deliver a number of new roadways within the site, which will reconnect the PRGS site into the surrounding Old Town North neighborhood. Additionally, our team is preparing a multimodal transportation study as part of the CDD review process. This study will include a number of recommendations for transportation improvements in order to mitigate the impacts of the project and improve the transportation network in the neighborhood. The exact improvements to be implemented and their phasing will be determined in the future infrastructure DSUP process. So we don't have specific details or costs on those yet, but those will be provided as the project moves forward. Our community meeting in March will go into more detail on the multimodal transportation study and its results. So please stay tuned for that. And lastly, on the economic front, we estimate that the project will create approximately 1,100 construction related jobs and nearly 3,000 permanent jobs, in addition to significant tax dollars for the city of Alexandria, both during the construction period and upon completion when annual tax revenue is projected to be approximately $34 million, again, in today's dollars. All of these are early estimates and they are all in 2021 dollars. Next slide, please. Over the last year, we've had many, many conversations with the local community, city staff and city leadership, which have helped to inform our approach to the PRGS project. Through these conversations, we've developed three primary design drivers that synthesize what we've heard as we think about the physical site planning of PRGS. You can see those three principles here on this slide. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Michelle, who will touch on each of these principles before we dive into the main topics of this evening. Michelle? Thanks, Melissa. Good evening, my name is Michelle Chang and I'm Vice President of Mixed Use at Hilco Redevelopment Partners. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So our first principle is to integrate the site and a lot of this information is a repeat from our previous um, community meetings. So I'm going to move through fairly quickly. The property is not located right in the heart of Old Town as most of you know, but we still want the development to feel really well integrated into the community and, sur and surrounding neighborhood. We do this with direct street connections, but also with friendly, inviting and walkable mixed use environment that you'll hear about later tonight. Consistent with a small area plan, there are direct connections at, um, um, starting from the top, Slater's Lane, and then moving south, North Royal and North Fairfax Streets. There are also two potential future access points at North Pitt and out to East Abingdon that will require cooperation with other landowners. Our second principle is to connect people to the waterfront. 
We've heard from the community and the city very clearly that Alexandrians want better and more usable connections to their waterfront. We focused a lot of attention on how to improve both visual and physical connectivity to the Potomac River by orienting, orienting the roadway network in a way that shortens this physical distance to the waterfront and opens up view corridors. Our third principle is to provide meaningful open space, which was the topic of our community meeting in November. We're adding nearly six acres of on-site public open space that is seamlessly connected to existing National Park Service parkland and to future linear park that is envisioned on the Norfolk Southern land to the Southwest. All told, over 14 acres of open space will be created or unlocked for public space. Next, great. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jared Krieger to talk to you about land use. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Jared Krieger. I'm a principal at the design firm Gensler. I'm the director of our mixed use studio out of the Washington DC office. And as a resident of Alexandria, I've jogged and biked past this site for many years, and I'm completely thrilled to be here tonight to share um, some of the opportunities on the site that we're considering and what a mixed use place could look like. Um, so next slide, please. You've heard us talk about the Old Town North Smell Area Plan, um, and that's something that the city and the community worked on and published in 2007, which identified a potential vision for the site and some planning strategies for the site. Um, and it's been a guide that we've used um, as we've started to develop the master plan. And it identified some intended uses for the site, including a desire to build a creative economy, encourage mixed use character, and expand that from Old Town North into the site. Successful mixed use places find a balance of residential, commercial, retail, arts, and most importantly, the spaces in between and the public spaces that um, Michelle just mentioned. Oftentimes blurring the lines between these spaces, this community is intended to be permeable, walkable, and, to, and support a diversity of people and functions. What I love about mixed use, place, mixed use places, it gives a variety of uses that activate the spaces and places at different times of day. And I'll share some more of that on the next slide. Next slide, thank you. So residential is one of those components. Um, and it's a key component for our vision of this mixed use site. And as, as um, Melissa said, we're pretty early in the process, so we haven't really designed any of the buildings yet. And these aren't necessarily representative of the buildings that will be on the site. These are representative of some higher density residential buildings that you are probably familiar with um, in our neighborhood, um, in, in the district and, and some beyond. And residential buildings, um, within these communities um, provide uh, around the clock activation of the site. Um, they give people resident, the residents opportunities to use the public spaces and the places in between the buildings and the places on top of the buildings, and it gives a 24 seven activation to the site. Next slide. Office functions, um, commercial office functions that are also contemplated on the site and in a variety of different ways whether it's a creative office function within a residential building, could be a portion of a building, or potentially a standalone building. So providing a variety of different offices gives the opportunity to welcome businesses to the site, welcome creativity to the site. And what offices do, they usually activate the site during the day and also breathe some additional life into the restaurants uh, and retail that's envisioned for the ground floor of the project. Something else that was in the Old Town North Small Area Plan um, was contemplated office uses, um, but also creative places and innovation. Um, in the Old Town North Small Area Plan, there is a lot of description about the innovation and arts character of Old Town North and that corridor that wants to be extended into the site. And these innovation places aren't necessarily just places for work. They're intended to be permeable. They're intended to be walkable and inclusive and places where all people feel safe and welcome and bring a variety of perspectives. And that's what really encourages innovation and allows casual interactions at the human level. It's an environment that encourages a sense of discovery and curiosity and woven into the fabric of the community. 
So these are some images that could be within residential buildings, they could be within commercial buildings. It really blurs the line between you. Next slide. Retail is something that I think we're all familiar with, and it really brings a mixed use place to life. It really addresses the human scale at the base of the building and our day to day interactions. One of the ways that we welcome visitors to sites like this, it brings the outdoor in and the indoor out. Something that the Old Town North Small Area Plan encourages is concentration of retail in public areas, which we completely agree with. As you've seen on the proposed plan, we have generous open space around the site, but we also have a central plaza that we're envisioning and a waterfront park, which is exactly where we intend to have some of the retail concentrated. Again, to activate that site and activate the public spaces in between the buildings and adjacent to the buildings. These buildings are intended to have flexible spaces that could have a variety of retail uses, including restaurants and cafes and outdoor seating. This is what brings a successful development to life throughout the day and into the evening. And then lastly, the Old Town North Small Area Plan has an emphasis on arts and continuing an arts corridor through the site, north into the site where it could act as a terminus and a special place um, for that. Arts doesn't necessarily have to be traditionally what we think of, where it could, like an art gallery, it could be, but it could be so many other things. Our goal is to have a diversity of possible arts uses to be considered, which could be performance art, it could be public art features, it could be creative open spaces, which could support and encourage public art events and actually interacting with art and art features. We've got a significant amount of public open space, which is key which is a key part of this project to support the diversity of uses and make it a great mixed use place. Next slide. So the image on the right, that's from the, that is from the Old Town North Small Area Plan. Um, it, it shows the purple area that's called sub area five in the plan. Um, this is what was envisioned as a mixed use innovation district. Um, on the site, it could serve as an economic anchor for Old Town North. The goal is to attract creative entrepreneurial people and companies and commercial activities and a mixture of environment in a mixed environment that has both housing and retail and amazing neighborhood amenities. Um, and in the Old Town North Moralia plan, they also started to envision what some of the density could be and continuing this as a concentration of higher density on the site. So that plan, um, again, that the city adopted um, in 2017, envisions 2.15 um, million gross square feet or gross floor area. That's what that was envisioned in the small area plan. Slide. So a couple of the site content, context and constraints. We talked about this in one of the original meetings, um, and it's just worth a refresher quickly to show you um, the shape and size of the site. So you'll see the purple lines. That's the boundary of the site. To the right, which is east, is the Potomac River. Um, and on the south is the Old Town North um, area of the city. Go to the next slide. One of the oldest and largest, it is the largest contiguous site um, in Old Town, or I'm sorry, in Alexandria that's potentially being developed. Um, overall, the site has 18.8 acres. And what wasn't understood at the time of the Old Town North Small Area Plan was some of the easements and restrictions that are on the site. For example, on the east side of the site, there's a 40 and 50 foot building restriction line that acts as a setback from one side. There's a resource protection area um, off of the river that we're maintaining a 100 foot buffer from the river. There's also a fiber line easement that crosses the site on the north side um, and a transmission line easement on the southern portion of the site and then wraps up the western portion of the site. It's also important to note that the PEPCO substation shown in um, dark gray or, or purple on, on the screen, that's not part of the project. That's not part of the property um, that Hilco owns. And to the south is the Norfolk Southern Corporation, which is owned by Norfolk Southern Corporation, not part of the site. Um, and then to the east is the National Park Service land where the Mount Vernon Trail um, goes. So the 18.8 sector quickly starts to like quickly starts to shrink. Um, where only 11.9 acres is actually available for building development. And then once you factor in the construction of roads and sidewalks and open space, there's really only seven to eight acres 
of that land can be developed um, for actual structures, which just represents only about 40%, where the remainder of that goes to uh, open space. But, so one thing we wanted to emphasize was um, some of the things that weren't known <clears throat> during the Old Town North Small Area Plan. Um, and in particular, there's this large um, uh, easement along the southern part of the site that's shown in orange on the screen. And it's, and it's pretty large. To give you a sense of scale, it's 100 feet um, adjacent to block C, D, or A, B, C, and D. As you can see, a setback before you get to the property line. And then there's another large open space where the Norfolk Southern uh, land is. So it provides a very large uh, open space should in the future that ever be combined um, spaces. So that wasn't known during the Old Town North Small Area Plan. And that plan had envisioned actual structures could be built uh, on the area of the site that's shown in orange on the screen. But the current development doesn't have any structures planned for that portion of the land because we can't, we can't build on it. So that easement could have housed at least 350,000 square feet of development if it was buildable, um, like it was thought of, it could be buildable during the Old Town North Mill Area Plan. So that density has been transferred onto the block so that we can envision or align with the vision from the small area plan to build the full 2.15 million square feet um, um, that was envisioned in the small area plan. Next slide. I'm going to pass it to Mary Catherine to explain hey, some the additional benefits of the site. Appreciate that. Um, one of the uh, approaches that we are looking at um, on this site is the use of arts and affordable housing bonuses. Um, we have, <coughs> oh, excuse me. One of the things that uh, uh, Alexandria's zoning ordinance provides are tools for encouraging particular uses. And in this case, those tools encourage affordable housing and arts. And those tools permit each uh, property owner to look at whether they want to add up to 30% more square footage than is provided under their base zoning or their small area plan. What that means is that in this case, we can request up to 30% of a bonus for both affordable housing um, and the arts. They're not exclusive of each other under the small area plan. They actually are allowed to be used on top of one another. In this case, we are um, looking to utilize a portion of that 30% additional area that we can ask for. We are asking for the ability to um, increase our square footage about 250,000 to 350,000 gross floor area um, of bonus area, uh, depending on, <coughs> uh, and the exact uh, number is depending on uh, uh, the future uses that we are, um, are gonna provide on the site. And that amounts to not 30% of a request that we could uh, ask for, but a 12 to 15% amount. As you can see in the drawing next to you, what that represents is an additional amount of square footage in the building itself. These um, uh, colors are not representative of exactly where the affordable housing units would go, um, but that we could add that much square footage to, uh, to the project. You are allowed to add that square footage for affordable housing if you provide a third of that additional square footage in on-site affordable units, and that's the key here. You are allowed to add the 30% uh, square, uh, excuse me, 30% to uh, the building for arts if you provide an arts anchor space for free, uh, free rent, um, so that that's why you can then get that bonus. Now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Actually, I think you're turning it over Carolyn. to me. <laughs> that Carolyn. is okay. Um, I'm Carolyn Sponza. I'm a principal with the design firm Gensler's DC office and a colleague of Jared's. And um, Jared and Mary Catherine really um, took some time to outline um, the areas that were um, envisioned in the Old Town North Small Area Plan and bonuses that can be applied to development on the site. So 
what we wanted to do now was to really take um, those concepts and show how they overlap onto the framework um, and block parcel plan that has been developed to date. So again, just to review, the Old Town North Small Area Plan identified a base area of 2.1 million GFA for the site. In addition, a bonus density of between 250 and 350,000 GFA is um, conceived of um, to be applied in addition to the base uh, area of 2.15 million GFA. What that will result in is an overall area between 2.4 and 2.5 million GFA. And really that's the big, that, that's, that's the overall um, uh, target number. The diagram at the right-hand side shows how that area is envisioned to be distributed across the six development blocks. So the chart you see outlines the maximum areas that are envisioned for development on each block um, with varying GFA per block, roughly corresponding to the size of each block. So the larger the parcel, um, the more areas envisioned for that uh, particular development block. But we know it's not just about area, but it's about that great mix of uses that Jared talked about earlier. So what we shared in those precedent images and in previous presentations is the idea that a mix of uses across the block really creates to uh, the vibrant and cohesive nature of any um, great place. So what we've showed here in this chart is a flexible distribution of uses across the site of two types. The first is residential, which is relatively self-explanatory, and the second is commercial. Commercial can in include a wide range of uses, including office, hotel, retail, and arts. And so what we've shown in this chart is a range of potential area distributions for those types of uses, with between 20 and 60% of the overall area being commercial and 40 and 80% being residential. In addition, we've shown a chart that indicates which type of uses, commercial and residential, are envisioned for each of the independent blocks, and those correlate to the colors that you see on this diagram here. And the idea is that we want to um, provide for the maximum flexibility of uses moving forward. Now, why is flexibility good? It's really good for a number of reasons. One, it allows the development to be responsive to market conditions as they change over time. And two, it allows the development to grow and change organically um, to correspond to the wants and needs of community and users. So again, planning for this flexibility isn't just about planning for agnostic uses, but also thinking about what happens at a ground plane level. And so activating the ground plane with a variety of uses and design features is extremely important in making sure that all of the uses flow together across the site. So some ways that we um, are able to activate the ground plane um, are thinking about connections to nature and the waterfront. In the previous community meeting, um, OJB, the landscape architects, talked about um, the great opportunities to provide um, connections to nature and the waterfront, integrated recreational spaces. So that'll be a feature of what happens at the ground plane, as well as um, frequent building entries. So with mixed uses, um, office uses, and residential uses, you'll have major entries that will front on all sides of the block, creating the ground level um, feel and vitality that's essential for an activated ground plane. And lastly, planning for the right mix and amount of retail at the ground plane is another great driver as it draws people to different anchor locations across the site. So we are just very at the beginning of thinking about what retail activation at the ground plane will look like. But again, it goes back to the idea of planning for flexibility as the buildings develop over time. Some of the key principles that we've outlined for retail activation are um, taking cues from the Old Town North Small Area Plan. So for instance, we're looking at where the optional retail corridors are indicated in the plan and envisioning how those may lead into the retail experience of the site. We know that as a principle, retail um, needs to be continuous and concentrated in order to be successful. 
So for example, um, there's a uh, open space in the middle of the site that would be a great location for a continuated and concentrated retail experience with a variety of restaurants, um, dining establishments, and other retail locations. We also know that in addition to um, retail fronting, this park in the waterfront, um, a mix of uh, uh, retail that faces Old Town North will be essential in making the connections um, from existing and planned um, retail connections in Old Town into the site. And lastly, um, we're putting a high focus on creating a ground plane experience that's transparent, connecting the activity from outside the buildings to what's happening inside the buildings and creating a clear interplay of spaces um, between indoor and outdoor. So Melissa, I think you're gonna jump in here. Yes, thanks, Carolyn. As previously discussed, we've been working actively with the Office of Housing Staff to develop an approach to affordable housing that will be consistent with the city's policy goals. We're considering a multi-pronged approach that may involve a variety of strategies, including a voluntary monetary contribution, as we mentioned earlier, which is used by the city to create offsite units, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a portion of that contribution could be converted into onsite units, which are called set aside units, meaning that there is a deed restriction placed on them, guaranteeing their affordability. As, discuss as discussed tonight, the project is also seeking between 250,000 and 350,000 square feet of additional density bonus to be divided between arts bonus and affordable housing bonus square footage. One third of the affordable housing bonus space would be set aside as on-site affordable units. Another potential avenue is a public-private partnership where public funding could be used to leverage developer contributions in order to create on-site units, typically at lower affordability levels than set-aside units are offered at. Those same structures may allow for the co-location of affordable housing and arts uses and or the creation of affordable housing for artists. These different mechanisms provide for different levels of affordability, of affordability based on a range of AMI levels. AMI stands for area median income, and basically that means the median income in a metropolitan area. For reference, in 2021, the AMI for the DC metropolitan area for a family of four was $129,000 per year. And then affordability levels are defined as a percentage of that AMI. For example, set aside rental units are typically offered to individuals and families in Alexandria that earn 60% of AMI whereas leveraged rental units created through a public-private partnership typically are offered to people who earn between 40 and 80% of AMI. And homeownership units are typically available to buyers who earn between 70 and 100% of AMI, whether or not those are set aside or leveraged units. To ensure long-term affordability of any on-site units, deed restrictions are typically put in place for 40 years for rental units and obviously in perpetuity for home ownership units. We're currently working on our affordable housing plan with staff that will be presented to AHAC at an upcoming meeting. Next slide. So just like we talked about land use, now we're going to talk about a building height strategy um, applied to the site. And like with the conversation about areas, um, we began the height conversation by looking at um, guidance that was provided in the Old Town North Small Area Plan and the Old Town North, North Urban Design Standards and Guidelines document. So what you see here is an excerpt from the Small Area Plan that shows anticipated ranges of heights on the um, Potomac River Generating Station site. So what the um, Old Town North Small Area Plan envisioned was a gradient of heights on the site between 50 and 140 feet. 
A buffer was planned at the west edge of the site that was 50 feet that would plant that would provide a transition from the Old Town North neighborhood to development on the site itself with heights in between 85 and 140 feet um, moving basically plan west. In addition to the small area plan, guidance was provided in the um, urban design standards and guidelines for Old Town North that talked about transition um, zones um, across Old Town North and the property itself. What you see on the left is an excerpt from the standards and guidelines documents that indicates areas of required building transitions um, within the neighborhood. Um, the blue line that you see here is actually overlaid into the approximate property line, which we've dropped on this map, that shows how the intended transition zone overlays into um, the block plan that we have today that is shown at the right. So what this indicates is that the standards and guidelines um, intended for there to be a transition in this block that we call block D, that is one of these four types of um, massing changes intended to form a um, transition between existing development and new. Thank you, Carolyn. And th this slide is intended to give you a reference point. I actually saw one of the questions that somebody put was asking for the what the height of the existing smokestacks are. And as you can see in the photo in the top left, um, the existing smokestacks are 162 feet high um, from the adjacent uh, grade area. And then some other familiar buildings immediately around it, just so you can get a reference point for um, what the heights are related to is, as you know, along the river on the just south of our site, there's some commercial office buildings with some additional height, including 1199 North Fairfax, which is approximately 110 feet, uh, Marina Towers to the north, which is 135 feet, uh, and the new building um, nearly complete, um, the Muse, which is approximately 95 feet high. That's just to give you uh, a reference point of what's around us. So, as Carolyn had said, um, the Old Town North Small Area Plan had a height overlay um, that was intending some transitions from the adjacent neighborhood. And um, what you're seeing on the screen is an overlay of that diagram in the colors um, on top of what our proposed site plan is. Um, and we spoke a lot about it in a prior meeting, which we've also reoriented our grid for all of the benefits for accessibility to the water. Um, direct lines of sight to the water, um, getting people closer to the water uh, and open space, uh, in addition to the site constraints and the easements that I talked about a little bit earlier. So the height in the Old Town North Small Area Plan was based on an illustrative block plan that's different than what we have uh, in the proposed plan, um, and including the fact that we have a 100-foot buffer from the southern property line um, um, partially due to the easement. Um, so this diagram shows how the Old Town North Small Area Plan heights don't necessarily align with the block plan that we currently have. So we've worked with the city staff to realign the heights um, to be more applicable to the plan that best fits the land. Thanks. Uh, back to you, Mary Catherine. Thanks, Jared. Um, we discussed these tools earlier in light of how much square footage you could add to a site in exchange for affordable housing and the arts. Each of those tools also allows a project to seek additional height to add to the project over and above the limits imposed by the zone or the small area plan in which the property is located. These tools permit HRP to ask for up to 25 feet of additional height for including an arts anchor in the project and or including on-site affordable housing. Each tool permits HRP to seek that 25 feet as represented by the box at the left. You can add 25 more feet if you provide an arts anchor space rent-free, and you can add 25 more feet if you provide a third of that in on-site affordable housing units. These often work together with the square footage bonuses, but they can work independently. These tools can be very complex. These height bonuses can only be applied where the base zoning height is higher than 50 feet. Again, please note that where the colors are located aren't representative of exactly where the affordable units might be located, but just to demonstrate how much additional height you could add. Carolyn? Thanks, Mary Catherine. 
So Jared um, talked a little bit about some um, guidelines for height distribution in the small area plan and Mary Catherine talked about tools that could be applied um, that um, modify uh, heights given bonuses. And what you see here is another important consideration to establishing heights on the site. So what this diagram shows is an initial uh, study that indicates what maximum heights are on the property given the property's proximity to Reagan National Airport. So in any property that's near an airport, the Federal Aviation Administration provides guidance on maximum heights um, given uh, takeoff and landing requirements and instrumentation for aircraft. So in this heat map, the darker colors, the, the reds and the oranges indicate lower height allowance areas, with the yellow and green areas indicating areas um, that uh, uh, higher uh, construction heights may be allowed. So what you see here is in the red, um, heights under 168 feet are likely anticipated. Uh, getting taller to the southern portion of the site where uh, heights of around 192 feet um, may be allowed. So again, these heights need to go through two additional submissions to the FAA once building massing for each of the structures has been um, completed. And before we move to the next slide, I do just wanna stress that these heights are maximum heights which are basically from the ground plane to the top of any structure of the building, which means mechanical equipment and penthouses. And this slide talks about um, proposed heights across the six development blocks. And these heights are different than those on the previous page because these are zoning heights. And typically zoning heights are measured to the top slab of the highest occupiable floor. Um, so this is why um, here you see heights um, that are up to 172 feet, 160 feet, and on block A, 70 feet. Um, so I do just wanna stress that these block heights are maximums, and we anticipate that there will be a variety of heights across each of the parcels and within each parcel. Um, so the specific building heights um, and distribution across each of these parcels are not determined now. They'll be determined as part of the DSUP application phase. Um, and everything we show here necessitates the use of both bonus height and density. Sometimes it can be hard to visualize what absolute building heights um, may look like on a site. So we've taken each of these maximum block heights and equated them to an approximate number of maximum stories that we might see across each of these development blocks, starting with five floors from block A and ranging up to 16 floors in blocks B and C, which are in the middle of the site. Again, just to kind of help provide a visual on the relationship of heights and floors, um, we've selected images of some buildings that you may be familiar with, the Dalton Marina Towers and Alexandria House, which are three residential um, property examples ranging from 14 floors to 22 floors. We've included these to kind of give an idea of what the relative mass of the building might look like um, with buildings of these heights. We've shared a similar set of images for commercial buildings. So again, these are office buildings, um, starting with Centennial Center, WMATA headquarters, and the NSF office building. Um, Centennial Center is seven floors, WMATA is 13, and NSF gets up to 16. And what you start to see in some of these images is that it's not just about height or massing, it's also about a variety of architectural articulation that can be used to break up um, the perception of the building. Oops. And we did just wanna say that perception is everything, right? When we look at these buildings, we won't be hovering 50 feet above the ground, um, looking at the middle level, but rather we will be perceiving um, these projects to the ground plane. And this goes back to the importance of activating the ground plane and creating a public realm that's enjoyable, human scaled and related to the human um, experience. And so many of the things we've talked about today are really about how things are viewed, but the perception of space is really um, influenced by all the senses. 
And that's why the ground level experience is extremely important is you don't just um, see things, but you also use your smell, taste, sound and touch to perceive the entire environment. So studies have shown that places with a high level of stimulus, so like a lot of visual interest and um, people and activity are more successful places. And the architectural detail and variety that we are planning for these buildings, including at the ground level, will contribute to this um, perception of a vital, interesting um, and engaging place. But really what it comes down to is people and places where people like to be attract more people. Um, they create more foot traffic. Um, they're able to attract more amenities and um, great features. Uh, like cafes and markets, and um, it's the intensity of uses and um, the volume of people that are attracted to a place um, that allows benefits such as art uses and affordable housing to be realized. And so we've included two Jan Gell quotes here, and the last is one of my favorite. A good, a good city is like a good party. People stay longer than really necessary because they're enjoying themselves. And that gets to the root of what we're trying to create with this development, a place where people will enjoy and discover new things and engage with nature. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, well, we wanted to talk to you about uh, the next steps uh, and how you can stay involved. We wanna end uh, this part of the presentation tonight by reminding you how you can continue, can you go to the next slide please? You can continue to engage with HRP and the city in this process in the coming months. We went through all of the previous meetings, which is in gray there, uh, and that pink dot is where we are tonight. As discussed earlier, we'll have our next community meeting on February 24th on the environment and sustainability. And we'll be setting up another meeting in March to discuss transportation. We'll keep you all posted on that date. We'll also be getting our next CDD plan submission called the completeness submission to the city later in February. <clears throat> All of these submissions and topical meetings are moving us towards public hearings on the CDD concept plan in June of 2022. So we still have plenty of time to work together as we transform the unsightly power plant site into a vibrant mixed use community that weaves into the fabric of Old Town. We would like to acknowledge that a number of city staff that are on this call and they're here uh, to help us answer your questions as we go forward. And so now we look forward to answering those questions as best we can. Okay, we have a number of questions already. Um, uh, the first one is, um, are there any concerns about the noise pollution from National Airport affecting people's enjoyment of the outdoor space? Will anyone be studying this? Melissa, do you want to take that one? Sure, uh, I would say yes. First of all, we mentioned a little bit tonight how we will have to put an application in for review of, of building heights uh, for with the FAA. Uh, I want people to also understand that there are residential standards uh, to which residential buildings need to be built to in terms of what's called sound attenuation and how much sound tra translates from outside to inside. Um, that's probably if some folks are in are residents of Old Town North that probably live in buildings that have considered that. So all of that is an attempt to mitigate the, the sound um, from the neighboring airport. In terms of exterior locations, obviously, it's a little bit trickier uh, to do that, but there are elements that we can plan in certain kind of, I would say, high density or high traffic areas where you might want to have activities like music activities or um, theatrical events or those kinds of things where we can try to um, put some um, discrete punctual uh, overhead structures that can help to mitigate sounds. Landscaping will help to absorb uh, sound as opposed to hardscape, right, which will uh, reflect the sound back and cause it to reverberate. So those are all things uh, that we'll be taking into consideration and then trying to plan for appropriate elements in, in different locations of the open space that are related to what those open spaces will, might be used for. Okay, thank you. Um, we did have, Jared, I think you already answered this for comparison, um, how tall are the existing smokestacks? And, and we showed that as part of the presentation. So thank you for doing that. Um, our next set of questions actually relate 
to uh, the financing of this project that I'm going to ask to turn over to you also, Melissa. Uh, we have two questions. How does Hilco propose financing the project and do you have an equity partner? Uh, sure. Uh, well, for like most uh, commercial real estate projects, this project will be financed through a combination of debt and equity financing. Uh, so much like uh, when you go out and buy your own home, you have a down payment, uh, which is your equity. Uh, it's your capital that you're, you're putting in. Uh, and then you go to the bank and you get a mortgage, you get a loan uh, that helps you uh, to pay the balance of the purchase price. So commercial real estate uh, projects are a little bit more complicated, but effectively uh, are using both of those sources of capital. So there'll be private um, equity invested in it, uh, some of ours and um, some of our partners. And then we will also uh, put uh, construction loans on it as we're, as we're building. And then typically when a project is completed, you will put uh, what's called a permanent, uh, permanent debt on it. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, our next question uh, is um, from a, a lifelong resident uh, with an, an activist with Unite Here uh, saying that he has significant uh, land use and height concerns because Hilco's uh, latest draft seeks additional height for the development without utilizing the city's density or height bonuses. I think, um, Mr. Reynolds, I just want to make sure that you saw uh, that portion of our presentation where we um, had some significant discussion about how we are utilizing um, both the uh, bonuses under the city's zoning ordinance for um, affordable housing and for, for the arts. But thank you very much for the question. Um, the next question is, uh, where is Marina Towers on the map describing height? What plans are there for transitions abutting this property in the Salvation Army National Headquarters? Um, Carolyn, I don't know if you can switch to that page of your height um, uh, diagrams. Um, do you want to try that one, Carolyn or Melissa? Do you want to take that one? I think Carolyn or, or Jared could, could go okay. back to that slide and answer it. Yeah, I think awesome. that's it with the bubbles. I'm gonna try to maximize. Oh, I think I wanna go down maybe one more here. Um, so if, I guess, you know, to, to start with that, if you look at the original um, small area plan heights, there wasn't anticipated to be a transition zone on the north side of the site, like there was on the south side of the site. Um, and so we do believe that there's a significant dif distance between our last development block and um, existing building structures, including Marina Towers on the north side of Slater's Lane. Um, so it's not like it's a one-to-one -one relationship. We're not sharing uh, an abutting property line. Um, there is basically a roadway right of way and a setback between Marina Towers and um, the northern edge of development um, on our parcel. Jared, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, uh, says, driving through Crystal City recently, I found myself going through uh, a building canyon. Um, what specific steps uh, are being taken to avoid this type of canyoning occurring in this development? Jared or Carolyn, do you wanna take that? So maybe I'll start and Jared, you could jump in. Like, first of all, and not creating canyons is the idea of creating uh, street sections that have adequate um, dimension that allow um, space um, between the bases of buildings. Um, also, I think one of the things we said on the height slide is that within each of the development blocks, there'll be a variety of heights. And so location of a variety of heights in those um, development parcels or blocks can be located in such a way that um, the mass actually uh, does not always need to be on the lot line. So we don't need to have all of the um, mass always sitting on the edge of the property line, um, which will also give some um, breathing room when it kind of comes to the experience of, of going down the street sections. Um, Jared, maybe you could add um, something about architectural articulation. Yeah, and as we as we get into the architecture of the buildings, which we're not at that point yet, we we would continue to do some sun and, and shadow studies. And you know, I've, I've, I've also driven down those streets in Crystal City. And you know, th those are multiple dense buildings in multiple blocks in multiple directions, whereas our, we are we are a one block wide development. 
Um, so we've also paid careful attention to where we locate some of the open spaces around that. And we're going to do some additional um, sun and shadow studies, like I said, so that to make sure that there is a nice balance of sun and light exposure into those spaces. Thanks. Uh, our next um, question is on the affordable housing height additions. Um, does the one third affordable housing allocation apply to all of the residences in the entire building or only the extra floor addition? Could you go to that slide, Carolyn? The one on height for um, affordable housing and there you go. So um, thank you for asking the question. Uh, it applies to the amount uh, the height where the amount of height where that you added. Uh, and so if you can see here, well, though the affordable units might not necessarily be on the top two floors of the building, um, this demonstrates that you can get this additional amount of height in a project for providing on-site units. And a third of that additional height would uh, need to be, uh, in, would have that number of on-site affordable units. Uh, it, the exact location of them uh, would be interspersed throughout the building. Um, and so it's not necessarily only in the area where you see the blue here. Um, and I hope that that answers your question. It is, it is a very complex um, uh, section of the zoning ordinance and its application takes a, a lot of work to, uh, to get through, but thank you for that, that question. Um, our next questions, uh, we actually had several uh, that have come in and I'm gonna group them together from uh, a number of activists who have said, um, I'm watching the Zoom tonight uh, with other residents. Uh, we're concerned the hotel development is going to create more low wage jobs and put more pressure on the city's limited affordable housing. So Melissa, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, what I would say is that we're uh, obviously very early in the process. This is the coordinated development district uh, part of the process. and. What we're doing right now is permitting potential future uses, uh, commercial uses, including office, retail, and potentially hotel, and then residential uses, including both apartment uh, living and home ownership units. Uh, so we, we just to be very, very clear for, for everyone, we don't have a hotel designed today. We don't have any buildings. Uh, design today. We are uh, simply anticipating that at some point there may be a need for a hotel here uh, in, in, in the sense that the market in Alexandria may expand over time. This is obviously not going to be a development that is built in you know 12 to 24 months. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit longer. Uh, and it's got flexibility built into uh, the uses that are planned in order to respond over time to how the market may evolve. And that includes, you know, the commercial office market, that includes the residential market, and that includes uh, potentially the hotel market. So uh, what we've put in is what we think today, very early in the process, could be uh, the maximum size of a hotel that you might want to locate on this site of a, up to maybe 300 rooms. Um, we don't have a hotel partner. I will say candidly, I don't think the hotel component would come early in the project. Uh, it's certainly not gonna be part of the first phase or even the first couple of phases. Uh, because we would certainly want to have a, a level of, of density and other uses on the site already uh, in order to create a demand uh, for a hotel. Uh, so I, I would just caution everyone to understand that we're trying to be forward thinking in the sense of planning for the variety of uses that over time could contribute to the dynamism of this district within Old Town North. Um, but we are not um, today, we don't have a hotel design that we're, that we're putting forth. Um, and as far as the, uh, for, uh, we, we hear the concern on um, uh, affordability and that's why we're working uh, with the Office of Housing in the city of Alexandria to develop the multi-pronged uh, affordable housing uh, approach that we talked about earlier tonight. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question that has uh, multiple parts, so I think we'll just go through them one by one. Um, 
HRP documents that filed with the, the city projected that the project will eventually have 2,000 residences and a 300 hotel rooms. Is that still what HRP projects? So this, uh, Carolyn, do you want to go through the land uses uh, and the distribution again? Sure, we can do that. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, so again, like fle flexibility is key here. And that's really why you see sort of a, a range of um, commercial and residential uses. And the reason why the application, you know, specified a number of residential units and hotel keys. That's just outlining some potential um, flexible futures for the project um, and our best guess at this time on what might happen. Um, but, but again, I don't think that we're necessarily saying that this amount of residential definitely equates um, to a certain number of um, units at this point in time beyond you know, what we projected in the CDD submission. Thanks. Um, another uh, part of this question was, um, as we all know, Old Town North is experiencing a few um, office conversions to residential, which are happening actually a lot around the, the region, if not the country. Um, what is HRP's vision for the office buildings on this site? And what portion of the construction do we project for office? So if we stayed on this slide, um, Carolyn, I know you turned your camera back off. I didn't know if you wanted to address that. Um, so what's the future for office on the site? What's the what, what's the potential for, for office? Yeah. So the potential for office office is included under that commercial category of 20 to 60%. So um, with the overall area, we're projecting that's about 500,000 to 1.5 um, million GFA. So if you think about a um, typical office building today, that could be, you know, one office building, it could be multiple office buildings. Um, we wanted the flexibility on this plan to have office um, on a, you know, many of the parcels. So that's why you see here under um, commercial offices checked off in all of the blocks except the pump house, right, which is here. And we didn't talk too much about that structure. Um, but also office is changing, right? Like demands for office today are different than they used to be. And um, preferences for office space are changing as well. So there's different varieties of office space, class A office space, creative office space, and everything in between. So what this plan envisions is that there would, all of these parcels basically are sized appropriately for some type of office use if the demand is there um, at the time of um, that those parcels are developed. I might, I might just add, I might just add to that to that answer, Mary Catherine, because it's, uh, I think it's true in Old Town North specifically, there have been a number of um, what I would call class B office buildings that have been converted uh, to residential. And I would offer that, you know, part of the reason that that has been happening is A, there's obviously a lot of demand for um, people to live in Alexandria. It's a great community. It's a nice place to live. People want to be here. Um, but also that older commercial product, the older office buildings, are actually not that well adapted to office tenants today. The floor plates are, are very are much smaller, and they're actually a very good size for residential product. They don't have a very big, um, they're not very wide. They don't have a lot of depth from the facade into the elevator cores, and that they um, avail themselves of being uh, converted to, to residential uses quite easily. Um, if we are to build uh, office use on this site, we'll obviously be trying to build the um, type of office that forward thinking uh, tenants will be looking for. And uh, uh, Carolyn mentioned creative office uh, is a type of use that you could see here, um, which is more of a loft style office, think open office uh, kind of structure with much taller ceilings um, that allows for collaboration and those kinds of things. Those are the kinds of things that tenants are looking for today. And that would be kind of our vision of what kind of commercial office space might want to be here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we had a, a bit of a specific question, and I don't know if we have a, a, a specific answer for it. Do we have a, a projection for the number of underground and off-street parking spaces that we are uh, looking to provide? So um, I think we have estimates, and those are going to continue to um, evolve, and that is obviously very tied to exact to exactly what's on this slide. 
how much of the overall square footage ultimately gets developed as residential and how much ultimately gets uh, developed as commercial, as well as you know, continuing to think progressively about how our habits uh, as it relates to automo automotive automobile use are going to uh, evolve over time. Uh, I would say it's probably, you know, somewhere in the uh, three to 4,000 uh, car range, but that's something that we're, or parking space range, but that's something that um, we're continuing to study and that will continue to evolve um, throughout the project. But um, we'll be conceiving of the garage in such a, designing it in such a way is that it will be expandable from one phase to another. Thanks. Um, so to keep on, uh, there are a number of questions on height. Um, and this next one is, given the variety of the building heights being uh, discussed uh, and the mention of other buildings in uh, Old Town North that are similar in height, what consideration are we uh, giving to the effect these heights will have on the blockage of views to the Potomac River? Um, and so, I mean, Carolyn, do you wanna start on that? And then we can see if others wanna um, weigh in. Um, well, that is a good question. Um, I think, you know, we've done a few things in establishing the block height plan. Um, you know, um, the small area plan had high heights um, on the south side of the site, and we are cognizant that closest to um, the development along the waterfront, we think it makes sense to actually step down the massing. So instead of building up to the maximum that's in the small area plan, we identified block A as an opportunity to actually go lower in order to um, kind of keep promoting um, views to the Potomac. We do feel that with the continuation of the existing street grid into the site, um, we are still allowing for um, uh, good views. Um, and as we continue to refine the massing of the individual buildings, we'll obviously consider views um, through, from, and across the site um, to the waterfront. And I would, ju I just want to tag onto that, Carolyn, just to, I know you said this earlier, but just to make sure people understand when looking at this block plan, you know, we've got the blocks labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those are not building footprints. Those are the city blocks. Those are the full blocks. So within that, there will, there will be um, buildings with different massing and, and a variety and a variety of heights. Uh, and I would also add that the um, turning of the street grid as you enter the site is a specific and deliberate strategy in order to open up those view corridors uh, to the Potomac and to protect them so that, so that you can see them. One of the things that we heard a lot in early conversations with community members and on um, the site tours that we did in June and November was, you know, you can, you can be a block away from the water in Alexandria and not know that it's there um, because the, the way the street grid is running parallel to it. So here we um, made the choice, the deliberate choice to turn it towards the river so that you actually open up that perspective and see the river. Thanks. Um, staying on heights, um, blocks B and C have max heights of 172, uh, while the Old Town North Mill Area Plan lists the max of 120. Um, the height you listed in 2021 was 160. Why the change? That, that's an easy one. Um, that's because uh, between the first CDD submission and the second CDD submission, which is what we're talking about now, uh, we got into deeper conversations with the city staff about applying the arts and affordable housing heights and density bonuses. So that's the reason for the height increase is because it's including uh, that bonus height now. Um, Melissa, another um, change to point out on that is we've also um, tightened up the site area because we we enlarged some of the open spaces adjacent to the to the parcels, right. which um, pushed the parcels in. That's a good point, Jared. Um, the next one is: Do we have a slide with a visual of the projected buildings on the site with the surrounding buildings? And do we have an estimate for the number of new residents? Um, I think the answer is we don't. We haven't designed the buildings yet, so no, we don't have a visual of the projected mm -hmm. buildings. But um, do you want to add anything else to that? 
No, but I think as we move into the DSUP plans for the future fa phases, we'll be getting into specific building massing and then into specific building design. And we'll certainly be able to provide that kind of imagery uh, when we get to that stage of design. Uh, and then the um, uh, application is for the, the, um, the CDD application is for all of the uses that we described today. And it's for up to 2,000 units. Uh, and um, that, that would be at the maximum end of the residential range. Thanks. Um, uh, another question uh, for someone who does a, a lot of what Jared does and spends a lot of time uh, walking and biking around the site. Um, he sees that the river is shallow along the waterfront um, and has lots of rocks and logs. And other than looking at the waterfront, uh, what do we envision for making the river accessible for boating and other activities? Um, we actually had a really great uh, community meeting on uh, open space uh, and have a, had some really good um, uh, images of what we were considering for that. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you're, uh, you want to just answer that question to give um, a little insight into that. Ryan is here. Ryan, do you want to take that? Apologies, I was muted. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we we are looking at some water activation um, with uh, working with the National Park Service um, as they own the land along the waterfront. Um, we are looking at potential for um, some overlooks on the water, along with um, the potential of kayak launches um and potentially even um a dock of sorts that would uh be maybe for a water taxi so uh i think that's, and I, that's about it. that no that's great ryan and i would just add um that if you go to our website if you weren't able to make the open space uh presentation that we did i think it was november 29th um, that on our website, hrpalx.com, you can download the presentation from that meeting. You can also uh, watch the YouTube video of the entire presentation. Uh, and there's uh, more content in there on, on open space design. Thanks. Uh, we did have another uh, question on height. Um, do the heights of the buildings include the underground parking or does the height start at the current ground level, Mount Vernon trail level or another level? Jared or Carolyn, do you want to take that? Yeah, that's the current ground well, or the approximate current ground level. As you know, there's, there's a big depression in the center of the site where coal used to be mounded up. Um, so some of that would have to get filled a little bit. Um, and the site sits up high relative to the water nearby, but it's measured from approximate grade around the site, which is not gonna change significantly from what's existing today. Thanks. Um, so this is sort of a long question that I'm gonna try and synthesize, but it, it has to do with when the original arts district text amendment was adopted, um, that at the time it was intended to be a trial um, and that there was going to be a study about its application um, after that trial period ended. And, um, that study has not been completed. And so um, there needs to be a, a discussion about determining how anything but affordable housing units uh, should be provided in terms of a density bonus, uh, especially um, uh, with a project of this scope. And so I think it, there's no question in the, in the statement, but I think it brings up a good point that we are still working with the city to make the determination as to how we are applying these bonuses, how much of it will be for affordable housing versus how much of it will be for the arts. Um, but we, hear, we take the comment uh, uh, seriously and, and thank you very much for, uh, for letting us know about that. But we are really working hard on trying to figure out which, how best to apply these, um, these bonuses that the city created in order to, um, uh, encourage those types of uses in this area. Okay, the next one um, is a more specific one um, about how the debris generated in the deconstruction is going to be removed from the site. Melissa, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that um, to be clear, we have not engaged a contractor yet on the um, demolition of the existing uh, power plant. 
So we don't have a specific plan uh, yet, and we will have to prepare uh, what's called a construction management plan that will be submitted uh, to the city for their review and approval that will um, go through all of the um, kind of access into the site and out of the site as it relates to construction or deconstruction, which would be the first phase uh, on the site. Um, I would expect that uh, the vast majority will be uh, via via trucks. Um, we don't own, I think as Ryan said earlier, we don't own the waterfront. Uh, that's actually owned by the National Park Service. Um, I don't think there's much opportunity uh, to get across the National Park Service land uh, in order to barge anything out. And I think also as some, as some another participant noted, it is very, very shallow at that uh, section of the Potomac as well. So uh, I would say mo more to come on this one. And um, as we do uh, consistently in other, in other projects, we will hold a series of informational meetings with the public in advance of doing any work on the site um, related to the deconstruction or the future construction, where at that point, we will know a lot more than we know today. And we will be able to communicate uh, to people more details on that. We'll also set up a website uh, where people can go to get regular updates on, on progress. So we're still a little bit of ways away from, from that point uh, in the project process yet, but that uh, when we do get there, there will be plenty of information uh, and channels for people to get it and to ask us questions. Thank you. Um, we have uh, an interesting comment along with the question. Um, uh, saying that they're uh, grateful that the principals uh, either live here or work near, use the area here. Um, and as uh, you use the bike path, do you think the lack of... Okay, Catherine. ...starts with whether or not the sun is going to um, be impacted. Mary Catherine, you cut out there for a second. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Okay, can you hear me now? We hear you, yep. yep. Okay, yep. Um, so the question is, do you think the lack of sun when taught with tall buildings uh, is gonna impede the light from hitting the river and impact flora and fauna? Um, and how might, that, um, how might that impact that? So I don't know if you wanna take that question and or Ryan. Yeah, Carolyn, maybe, yeah, that's a good plan that, um, so thanks for the, the nod of local residents. So I, I appreciate that. and. As you know, that, that's a pretty lush part of the trail. There's lots of very mature trees and, and already casting lots of shade and shadow on that from the National Park Service land. Um, so we are in talks with the National Park Service. Uh, you know, there's no intention of cutting down trees or those trees, but we're, we're certainly willing to help them with some of the deferred maintenance, like invasive species of vines that are strangling some of those trees. So there's a lot already a lot of shade there, but um, what you see on this plan is there, there is a hundred foot buffer um, away from the water where, where you can't build anything, any vertical structures or significant vertical stru structures. But you'll see even beyond that, the parcel lines, for example, blocks, you know, like all the blocks are set back even further than that, um, where you see actually block C, one of the bigger blocks is, is set back with what is essentially more than a hundred feet beyond the hundred foot buffer. So there's quite a considerable distance for any of the vertical structures um, between that and the waterfront. So aside from like very much or at late afternoon sun in the summer, there, there's really shouldn't be a considerable change on the water's edge. And indeed, um, that's the purpose of the resource, uh, one of the purposes, right, of the resource protection area. Correct. Um, this is an interesting question. Can, can we uh, estimate how similar this property will be to either National Harbor or the wharf? Jared? Yeah, uh, I, I can start that. <laughs> I, I think you could you could say it will be similar in some ways and different in other ways. So th they're both mixed use parcels and National Harbor was built over time. We're going to be built over time in different phases, similar to the wharf. National Harbor has a mixture of uses, we'll have a mixture of uses. National Harbor ha is 
um, different in that it, several different developers were building that at one time. And in this case, it's the advantage of Hilco um, having all of this land and being able to develop it together or, or have a cohesive strategy for developing it together. Um, so I, I think there's both similarities and differences. And one of the biggest similarities is, is the mixture of uses on the site. I think we're going to have a lot more open space than those developments, certainly a lot more open space than um, the wharf, um, where the wharf is um, much tighter of a density and not nearly as much open space. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I would say it's, oh, sorry, Carolyn, go ahead. Oh, no, I would just say one differentiator that I think, you know, they're all waterfront developments, but I think something that's particularly different and unique about this development is its connection to Old Town North and how it's being carefully tied into Old Town and connecting with, you know, points north as well. So this, this site is really a connector site. And the other two projects had very different contexts in which they were, you know, envisioned. Um, so I would say maybe that's one way that this project will be different than the other two. I think those are both good points. I think, yeah, at least compared to the wharf, which is a lot of and primarily hardscape, right? This this project will have a lot of green around it, parks on pretty much every side. And then I would just also offer that I think another differentiator is is scale. I mean, this project it will be smaller uh, than than those than those projects, uh, and so I think it's it's more Alexandria sized, uh, and I think it's appropriately sized for for the area. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions on affordable housing uh, in specific with regard to um, affordable housing. I did want to mention we do have someone from the city staff from the Office of Housing who's also on with us. So Tamara, if you want to uh, add anything. The question is, uh, first, thank you for the presentation. Um, will you consider including affordable housing units in each of the buildings on the different box? How many units roughly would be a third? And finally, what AMI are you considering? Um, and the another question was also on AMI. So maybe we could go to the slide. There you go. Melissa, do you want to start? Sure. I think, again, um, this is an ongoing uh, conversation uh, with with the Office of Housing and um, trying to sort of look at all of the different possibilities, whether that's a conversion of the voluntary contribution into the creation of on-site units or it's an application of the bonus density, uh, if any is used. Uh, those, I know it's sort of probably confusing for people who don't live and breathe this every day, but those functionally can be, um, could be treated a little bit differently. Uh, and then another option is, as we mentioned, is a, is a public-private partnership uh, where you would create sort of a standalone affordable housing uh, project within the overall development. So um, I don't know that we can say today exactly where all of the units will be, uh, because it depends on those kind of those three things that I laid out. What 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 source of the of what source of um, resources are the units being created from? Um, but then there's also uh, I, I guess in terms I asked about the AMI levels. It sort of depends on again, where the resources are from, what AMI levels they're offered at. So that um, there's some bullet points on this slide that explain that typically set aside rental units are offered to folks that, that are uh, earning 60% of AMI levels, whereas a leveraged rental unit, which again, that means leveraging some public resources with private resources in order uh, to create units um, that are in a sort of a standalone condition that allows a bigger range of affordability. Those are typically between 40 and 80% of AMI, whereas home ownership units are typically between the 70 and 100% of AMI. So it's it can be up to uh, quite a range. So I would just say there's a pretty broad spectrum of possibility that's uh, on the table for consideration. And I did want to add that um, in terms of the question on the number of, but what would be the number in that one third? Uh, and I think that we don't have an answer to that yet. That's going to all be dependent on continued discussions with the city, but also how we 
which uh, of the bonuses we implement uh, and where, uh, and it's all going to be a part of, uh, of these discussions moving forward with, uh, with the Office of Housing and, and AHAC. So um, just don't have an exact number yet. I didn't know if uh, I'm going to see if Tamara wanted to add anything, but um, just let us know. Um, there is a, a question on, um, are there any plans to extend a Metro branch towards this site? Um, I know Daniel is on the call. Um, um, Melissa, I don't know if you want to um, uh, start with this one uh, or Daniel, because um, for a Metro branch, if you're asking about a, um, a uh, subway stop, the, there won't be any Metro of a subway here, but the transit is actually going to be extended into the site through DASH. Um, so Daniel, do you want to try to answer that one first? Hi everyone, Daniel Solomon, Grove Slade. We're the transportation um, consultants uh, for HRP and PRGS. Um, Mary Catherine, you answered that perfectly. I don't really have anything else to add to that, but uh, I decided to introduce myself anyway. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Did you want to add anything, Melissa? Are you good? Nope. Yeah, you okay. said it. Okay. Um, just a follow up. Somebody asked, what is AMI? So could you really quickly explain what AMI is? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, on behalf of the commercial real estate industry, I just apologize for the number of acronyms uh, that are used. Uh, it's just part of uh, the, the industry. But AMI uh, stands for Area Median Income. And that is essentially what's the median income of a metropolitan area. Uh, that can vary, right? The median income in Alexandria is not the same as in Houston, is not the same as in New York City. So um, it's really the, that median point, if you take all of the incomes and you stack them up from you know, A to Z, what's the one in the middle? Um, uh, and that is the median income. And it's based on the metropolitan area uh, where, where all of those incomes are being measured from. So as I mentioned earlier in 2021, the area median income in the DC metropolitan area for a family of four was $129,000. Um, so we obviously don't have the 2022 numbers yet. We won't have those uh, until next year, but that gives you an idea of uh, where that's at. And then you take, when, you, when I say 60% of AMI, what that means is it's for families of four that are earning 60% of the hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars a year, and that and that that hundred and twenty nine thousand will vary whether you're talking about a household of one person, two people, three people, four people, and so on. It is very complicated. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, we have a question with regard to schedule. Um, do we have a, a what's your current estimate in considering uh, the, the um, power plant land is ready to begin building? When do you see? Uh, that the community will see building being developed? Yeah, so um, we're uh, hopeful to have the CDD approved uh, in June of this year by Planning Commission and the City Council. And then we'll be going through what's called the infrastructure DSUP process. And we'll also be um, filing a sustainability master plan. So that will, the infrastructure DSUP process basically lays out like, what are the actual engineering drawings of the roads and the curbs and the sidewalks and all of that um, related to um, how do you uh, kind of unlock the land? Like how do you tie it back into the grid? All, all of that. Um, and then we'll put forward our first phase one DSUP uh, in um, probably later this year and then sometime in 2023 and then des finish designing the buildings for that. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to break ground on the first phase uh, in twenty in early twenty twenty four. So not that not that far off. Probably in about two years' time. Thanks. Um, I think we're a little bit over what we had estimated for our time frame. So maybe we do want a question, and then whatever we haven't gotten to, we will make sure is also answered and put up on on the website. Um, this one is about the uh, glut of um, office space available now. Um, the question is, are you concerned about offering too much um, office worker office space with this glut uh, likely now into the future in Old Town and all of the region? So I think that's one of the reasons that the plan has the flexibility that's built into it, right, uh, is because we don't know uh, exactly how the market will evolve 
over time. Uh, to, to be clear, we're not um, you know, planning to build it all at once. Uh, it will be phased both for residential uses and for uh, any commercial uses. So at a minimum, and this was um, something that was laid out in the small area plan, there will be 20% commercial uses on the site. But commercial uses on the site encompasses all of retail, office, and hotel. Uh, and arts uses, by the way. So at a minimum, 20% of the overall square footage will, will be that, um, but not all of it would necessarily be office. So I would just say, you know, we'll be smart as we uh, go forward in terms of the uh, timing of developing both commercial and residential and any other type of, of product here uh, in terms of delivering something that is in demand at the time because uh, nobody wants uh, the uses to send pay, to sit vacant. Thank you. Um, and I think this last one is it's just easy. Um, will the, re the recorded meeting be available? And the answer is yes. Um, we are gonna be posting a um, copy of the recording onto the website uh, that where we have posted all of the previous community meetings, as well as the question and answers um, that we received tonight and those that we hadn't been able to get to, those will also be included uh, in those questions and answers. So um, again, thank you all so much for attending. We really have had a good number of people participate in all of these community events that we've had, and we really, uh, really appreciate the good questions um, and the uh, uh, interaction of our neighbors. And as I said, we have another community meeting on February 24th um, that's going to be talking about uh, environment and sustainability. So hopefully we'll see a number of you there. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.